Hey everyone, it's Tox from CritsHappen.com. Thanks for watching and welcome back. We're here with another critique, this time of a game most of you may not even have heard of yet. So today we're going to be taking a look at a game called Viceroy. And yes, this is not in English. Uh, this is actually from friends of ours, Hobby World, who are in Russia. And this is in Russian. The rules, thankfully, were provided in English, which is great because I am not very good at Russian. Um, but Hobby World may be familiar to you. So we have done a couple of different uh, reviews in the past. We did a recent Kickstarter of theirs, which was Hollywood, and Hollywood was very successful. We enjoyed it. It was a movie making, card drafting kind of game. Uh, and then more successfully, probably uh, more widely known, was World of Tanks, the deck building game. We did a uh, review on that as part of a critical strike last year. Uh, Asmodee has, pu has uh, published that in the US and it is available right now. That's actually one of my more favorite deck building games to play. I really enjoy the mechanics of it and it's very unique in that every turn you're only starting with three cards. So you truthfully have to be very, very good at designing your deck and, and drafting your deck during the deck building me uh, mechanics of the game. But Viceroy is very different. So Viceroy immediately caught my eye. You can tell the, the cover is very powerful looking and, and power is a big piece of this game. The idea behind the game or the tagline behind the game is called build your pyramid of power. The concept is you're a Viceroy in Russia and you're going to use several different types of people to build a pyramid out of cards. You'll see here that the cards are gonna have different effects and different abilities on them. But primarily what I want you to notice right now is that there's three different colors. So for example, this is the Chancellor. He has a blue quarter circle, a green quarter circle, and a yellow half circle. And we'll talk to you a little bit about what that means as we go through the game. But the idea is really simple. You're gonna be stacking cards on top of each other to gain more and more powers as you build this pyramid. The game is going to end when cards either can't be replenished to draft for your pyramid or someone has built their fifth level of their pyramid. Now I'll warn you, this game takes up quite a bit of space. However, it does so in a really good fashion. So let's take a look. We liked Hollywood, we liked World of Tanks. Does Hobby World hit the trifecta and do we like Viceroy as well? Let's grab all of our power, let's grab all of our prestige and jump into the world of Viceroy. Okay. So here you see the setup for a two-player game of Viceroy. I'm not going to show uh, everything from a four-player game because, quite frankly, this game takes up a lot of space. So the idea of Viceroy is really simple. Each player is going to start with two Viceroy cards and three Law cards. Now, at the beginning of the game, you're going to pick one of your two Viceroy cards to put into your pyramid. Now, you have a couple of different things to note about cards. So let's take a look at the Governor, for example. The governor has a red semicircle on the bottom, a yellow quarter circle in the upper left, and a green quarter circle in the upper right. You may be asking yourself, what the heck is that all about, and what do they mean, and what do they do? Do they match up to these? Do they match up to these? What are they? Well, we'll get into it in a second. There's going to be different levels of a pyramid that you're building. And as you get cards together, you're not going to be able to put them on higher levels until you have things below them. So for example, if I had both the Chancellor and the Governor next to each other, then I could put another card on top of them like this. You're allowed to build as wide as you want for the base of your pyramid. However, you can only have five levels. Once a player has built their fifth level, that will end the game. Another way to end the game is if this deck runs out and we're unable to replenish the center area where we're going to be bidding to get more cards for our pyramid. Now, the Viceroy cards are primarily characters. They're going to go into your pyramid and they're going to give you benefits and abilities. The Law cards are going to be abilities that will trigger at different times in the game. So for example, this uh, Alchemy Guild tells me to choose one of three things when I place it into my pyramid. They get placed in your pyramid just like characters do and the colored circles match up. Or they don't in some cases like this with the red and the uh, green, but uh, logistically they all match up next to each other. So you may be asking yourself, well what's the whole point of that? Why do I want my colors to match up? Well, at the end of the game, you're going to be the winner if you're the person with the most victory points. I know, shocker, but it's how you get your victory points that's going to make this game very different and how you draft the cards that go into your pyramid that make it even more unique. 
So I said at the beginning of the game, each player is going to be dealt two Viceroy cards. And what's going to happen is you're going to get to put one of them into your pyramid for free. Now the other thing to know is that each player is going to start with two colored gems. So two blue, two yellow, two red, and two green. Now there's a certain number of gems per player. Now I'm shaking these up in my hands for a good reason. Each player takes two of each color, and in the two player game there's going to be eight of each color, and then they take out two randomly. So I'm going to put back a blue and a green. That means for me, I have two yellows, two reds, a green, and a blue. And these go behind my player screen. So players will start with differing uh, amounts of gems in each game. And this is it. These are all the gems we're going to have to play with. Even though the game does come with more, in a two player game that's all you're going to play with. Now in addition to that, there's victory point tokens and there's symbol tokens that you can collect. We'll talk a little bit more about that as I develop into the rules here with you. There's also going to be tokens that will count as victory points at the end of the game, and they stack. So for example, this tells me if I have this token, all of my magic scrolls are worth two points at the end of the game. If I get two different cards that have these, then they stack and each one is worth now four points. This one tells me for each completed red circle I have, I have two points. So that begs the big question, how do you complete red circles, or how do you complete circles at all, and why would I want to? Well. Here's the first thing I'll show you and I'll kind of progress through gameplay and you'll see how it works. I'm going to choose the governor to be the first person in my pyramid. Now as the first person you don't have to pay for them and I get their first level ability for free. On this card the governor says normally if I place him in my first level I have to pay a blue gem back to the supply and I get four gems of any color. As you move up and you put people at higher levels, you have to pay the below cost. So to put them in the second level, I would have to pay a yellow gem and a blue gem to get this yellow gem's reward. Now it's keen to know, you don't get the lower level rewards. You just have to incur the lower level cost. So I have to pay a yellow and a blue to put him in my second level, and I would get a defense shield and two gems of any color. If I put him in my third level, then I have to pay a green, a yellow, and a blue and I would get one of these tokens that tells me each of my magic scrolls is worth three points. And if I put him in my fourth level, I would pay a red, a green, a yellow, a blue, and I would get two magic scrolls on him. They may be asking yourself, Tox, you said you can go to five levels. How do you pay for the fifth level? It's really simple. If this was the character that was on my fifth level, I would pay all of the initial costs plus an extra of the top gem. So if the governor was going on my top level, I would pay two red, a green, a yellow, and a blue. And that would also trigger the end game. But let's talk about how we're going to get more cards to play inside our pyramid now that we have one card in our pyramid. The first thing that happens is we're going to flip over one card next to each of these arrows. Now in a two player game the bidding is much different than in a four player game only in terms of results. Uh, I'm just going to randomly pick a gem here and I'm going to go for my opponent and then I'm going to look at these cards. The way they're lined up is this card is for blue, this card is for green, so on and so forth. But in order to bid, it's not a matter of bidding the most of that gem. So for example, I may look at this card and go, well, I'm not really going to match anything up too much here. So maybe I want to go with the swordsman. His upper right yellow would go with my upper left yellow of the governor. It would also end up giving me two victory points and two gems of anything. Now one thing I totally forgot to do, uh, when you put this governor in as your first character, you actually get his reward for free. So I could have taken one of each gem as, uh, or any combination of four gems as my reward. That's essentially why I wanted him to be my first character inside of my pyramid. So I may be sitting here going, well, I really want this guy, so I'm going to bid blue. Now the interesting thing is, while I have multiple blues, I have two blues behind my screen, I'm not paying two blue. You essentially pick a color, not a quantity, a color, and you're competing over that, that card. So if this is my bid and this is my opponent's bid, we all flip open our hands at the same time. The opponent bid red, this goes back to the stock, and he gets the red card in his hand. I bid blue, so I get the blue card in my hand. Now at the very beginning of the game that's really easy because each player is going to get a card and we're going to move on down the road. However, moving on down the road means that anyone left over goes up to the top of these arrows 
and four new cards come out. Now what that means is next turn, let's say two people bid on the same thing. Let's say first two people bid on the, the blue card and there's only one blue card there. What's going to happen is in the lower left hand corner of each of the characters is a number. Whoever has the lowest number in their pyramid chooses first which card to take. So if both the opponent and I bid blue next turn, whoever has the lowest number in their pyramid is going to get this Pathfinder and whoever doesn't isn't going to get anything. However, there are three subsequent rounds of bidding for these cards. So if you ever get put in a situation where you and your opponent bid on the same thing and you lose, you're going going to have an opportunity to get another card in a second and third round of bidding. However, whenever you bid, you lose your gems back to the supply. So if next turn both my opponent and I choose blue, he potentially could get this if he had the lower number in his pyramid, and then my blue would still go back to the uh, supply. I would then essentially, as the only other player in this game, be able to bid on any card I want, but I would have lost that blue as well. If two players bid on a car, a color that has the uh, has two cards, one at the top and one at the bottom, then again, whoever has the lower number gets to choose which one they want, and the other person takes the other card. In a three and four player game, the same rules apply. So if all four players chose green, the lowest per the person with the lowest number in their pyramid would take a card first. The second lowest number would take the second card. The third and the fourth player's gems would go back to the supply and then they would move on to a subsequent round of bidding. You are also, and this is very important to note, you are allowed to pass bidding and take three gems of any color you want. You're not gonna get an extra card, but it will be a good way for you to catch up and get some more gems. Now, I went and picked up a swordsman. So the swordsman, I can then put into my pyramid. And you're gonna have a, a secondary phase where you have three opportunities to put cards into your pyramid. You can put one, two, three, or none if you want to. In this case, I will go ahead and put him in my pyramid because he's gonna help me match up a circle and you'll see why this is important in a second. So since he's on my first level, he's gonna cost me a green. So I'm gonna have to put a green back. And then he tells me I get two victory points. So I'm gonna take one of these symbols here that has two victory points on it and place that on him, showing that I have two victory points for the end of the game. And then I get two of any gem color. Well, I'm gonna take a green and a blue and kind of diversify in my colors. Now, this is good, I've already got victory points. I'm already starting to build my pyramid. But I'm also looking ahead. Now when I look ahead, I see that I have the bottom half of a yellow circle here. If I can complete the circle, I will get potentially bonuses at the end of the game, but I will also potentially get a gem. So let's say we move on to the next round. Let's say nothing else was done this round. We go back to bidding. Let's say I bid on green and my opponent did not and I choose this butcher. I can then put the butcher in my second level of my pyramid. And you'll notice that these all line up to make a full yellow circle. When that happens, you get to take a gem of that color from the supply and put it behind your screen. Now yes, putting him in my second level means I have to play a blue and a red. It's very keen to know you must make the payment first and put him in your pyramid before you get any bonuses here. So if this completed a red circle and I didn't have a red to pay for his costs, I couldn't just get the red for this and then use it to pay for his cost. You must pay the costs first and then handle getting the, the bonus, <coughs> excuse me, the bonus gem. Now what this means also is at the end of the game, you're gonna get points equal to the highest level a completed circle is in. So in this case, I would get two points because he's in my second level and that's a completed yellow circle. Now also, because I put him in my second level, I get a defense shield. He goes on there, and then I get two gems of any color. And again, I can pick whatever I want that's available in the stock. Now you may be asking yourself, well, what do the symbols mean? Now, the sets of icons go together. So if I have a shield, a magic scroll, and a science token at the end of the game, that's going to be worth 12 points for each set of those three different icons I have. In addition, there's also attack icons. 
Now, aside from having a shield be beneficial to completing your three symbol set, the attack icons will actually go behind your screen, and they can be used in two different ways. They can be used to bid on cards, or they can be used at the end of the game to attack your opponents. If you use them to bid on cards, they guarantee you a win. So if everyone else bids colors and I bid a sword, then I am going to win the color of my choice, which is a really nice advantageous move. If I know that I have a higher number than anyone else in my pyramid, it's a great way to be able to secure myself a card. However, at the end of the game, your opponent is going to lose four points for every sword attack icon you have behind your screen that they don't have a defense shield to protect against. So right now, if I have this one shield and my opponent acquires an attack symbol, I'm okay because one to one they cancel each other out. But if I start to see him gaining more and more swords, I may want to start stocking up on more and more defense shields or try and get my own swords to attack him as well. Now, gameplay is going to continue on with people discarding. Uh, once, once you don't draft from up here, they get discarded. And then creatures are going to move up. Uh, people will move up from row to row. And then you're going to continue bidding and building and bidding and building. The bidding is really the most interesting piece of the whole thing. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about is this Huntress's ability here. Let's go ahead and progress just a little bit, and I'll show you something that she can do here. So let's say I had the first mate out here, future, and then I had drafted the Huntress in the future. If I put her in my second level, not only do I get to complete a green circle, that was actually kind of nice, that worked out pretty well. Uh, not only do I get to complete a green circle and get a green gem, but her ability here, after I've paid my yellow and my green back to the, uh, back to the bank here, to the supply, says an infinity red gem. Now what that means is I actually take a red gem from the supply and put that on her, and in all future rounds, when I am paying for placement costs, I am considered to have a red gem. Infinity gemstones can be really, really powerful, especially if you get them early in the game. They're not game-breaking by any means whatsoever, but they will help you with your strategies and paying for different things as you progress through the game. Now, as you can see, there's also one other symbol here that is like a card symbol. I don't think anyone down here, yeah, the first mate has it right here. Whenever you see that card symbol, you're actually allowed to draw a card from either the law deck or the short deck. Whenever you set the game up, you're going to take a certain amount of cards out of here that are characters and put them in the short deck, and you're going to be able to draw from there as well. So there's multiple different ways to get cards, either from bidding or from drawing cards from their abilities. But as the game continues on, you're also going to find yourself in situations where your colors don't necessarily match up. So for example, let's say we're a little more progressed in the game, and let's say this is my pyramid right now. Now you'll see that some of my circles don't match at all, so I'm not going to get any bonus points for them. However, one of the really cool things is that at the very end of the game, one of the things you're allowed to do is use any remaining uh, gems you have behind your screen at the end of the game to paint circles. So for example, if I wanted to go one, two, three, I could paint that into a green circle. So each gem covers a quarter of the circle, making it a green circle now. Because that's a completed circle in my third level, I would get three points for that. If I had something that said you gain extra points for each completed green circle, that would add to it as well. So you can start to really stack up and rack up the points. I could do the same thing here with my extra three yellow gems and paint this into a yellow circle. It looks a little funky, but you get the idea of it and you start to realize at the end of the game it can be beneficial for you to snag some gems and make sure you have them to complete your circles. If this game ended right now, I have one, two, three, four completed circles and three of them are in my second level, which is going to give me six points, and one is in my third level, which is going to give me another three, so I would get nine points just off of my completed circles. It doesn't always work out that well, but there are some really good options and opportunities to be able to maneuver and manipulate things to make that happen for you at the end of the game. And like I said, the game continues on with you buying, matching up characters, getting characters in the right rows of where you want to gain their abilities, and then building up to get to your fifth level of your pyramid. If at any time this deck is unable to be filled so that you can draft more cards, or if somebody builds their fifth level, the game is going to end. Overall, Viceroy is a very, very quick game to learn. But as you can guess, with all the different abilities from all the different cards, there's a lot of different strategies that you can put into place. 
you could potentially go for nothing but victory point tokens. You could potentially go for set collection bonuses where you're trying to get the science, the magic, and the shields. You could go aggressive and try and get a lot of attacks, which again, at the end of the game, are going to be worth negative points if your opponents can't get shield cards. You could go for a balanced approach and try to balance three or four different things. And that's been the most fun inside of Viceroy. While it's an easy rule set and a simple way to learn how to play this game, there's a lot of different options that really open up some great experiences while playing it. So that's Viceroy. Viceroy is one of these games that's very, very easy to teach and very, very hard to master. I don't necessarily want to say it's going to take a lifetime to master, but there are a lot of things going on, even though the rule set is very simple. It sounds easy. Draft cards, match up circle colors, get more gems, pay for more abilities, and increase your power as you build up your pyramid. However, as things happen, they don't always go the way planned. So you're going to be reacting to cards that your opponent takes. I really think that the whole drafting bidding mechanism is really, really cool. I like the fact that it's not like you can hoard up blue gems and be able to pay five blue gems when I only can afford one or two. I think it's really cool that you only get to place one gem in your hand. And then from there, you guys could end up tying. I mean, you could, in a four-player game, all four people may go for the blue card, which is really interesting and, and makes it quite dynamic. Uh, it also makes the, the design of learning what your opponents are doing much more important. Uh, when we first played this game, it was a two-player game, and it was there were so many cards to draft that it wasn't too much of a problem running into each other. But in a four-player game, it's a lot more prevalent. You're going to have a lot more opportunities where people are trying to vie for the same card. Um, there should potentially be maybe a little bit of scaling in that, but it still works out really well. We've played with two, three, and four players. We've enjoyed it every which way we've played it. And that's probably the thing that struck me the most about this. This is inside of a world that there is from another game called Berserk. I haven't had a chance to play that yet, but I've been dying to. I've seen it on the shelves, and I just honestly haven't had a chance to. Uh, that's another hobby world game, and it looks really cool, uh, but I just haven't had a chance to play it yet. But a lot of the artwork and a lot of the characters come from that world. There's a little bit of everything. There are pirates involved, there are chancellors, there are princes. It kind of gives you a feel of its own world. It doesn't necessarily feel like you're in, like, necessarily like the 1800s or anything like that. Like, you feel like it's part reality and part fantasy. And the artwork's phenomenal. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I think the only drawback uh, coming from someone who knows a lot of colorblind gamers is there's not really a lot of differentiation between the colors to be able to determine really quickly if you're colorblind. Um, we do have someone in our group, as most of you may know who play with us, who uh, someone is colorblind in one eye, which makes it very interesting. Uh, and it, it becomes kind of a little quirky at that, case, at that point. But that's a, a minor nitpick thing. Uh, the game itself really does do a good job of pulling you into this world where you're trying to build the correct structure. I think one of the more interesting things inside of the game is that there are characters who have a much better uh, first tier or second tier ability than a third or fourth tier ability early game. But then late game, their third and fourth tier abilities become really, really powerful. So it's not even just a matter of the balance inside the cards, but it's a balance of the timing of when you see those cards. There are some cards that come out really early and you're like, oh man, I wish that would have come out much later. Or things that come out later and you're like, where was that at the beginning? Uh, there, there's a lot of different strategies and that's one of the cool things inside of the game. I think overall Viceroy does a really good job of pulling it all together. The only really downside that I have about the game is it does take up a lot of space. We play on a 42 inch by 42 inch table uh, and four players on that was pretty tough. It was, uh, it was very compact and very tight. Uh, but overall, again, if that's the, the nittiest nitpick that I get to, then that's not too much of a problem. At the end of the day, we've really enjoyed our time with Viceroy. Now, I haven't talked about this yet. This was originally going to be kickstarted, and I believe that they're pulling it away from Kickstarter, and they're just doing a straight publication of it. Uh, and I believe, uh, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I believe this is either at Essen or will be released by Essen. So if you're going to Essen, definitely take, take time, run by Hobby World's booth, 
check it out. They've got a lot of great games. I personally think that they're a really good company. I think they do a really good job in terms of all the different types of titles that they bring out. And Viceroy looks to be another uh, success for them. So we're very happy with it and we hope that you've enjoyed this as well. But as always, let us know your thoughts. Head on over to critshappen.com. You can vote in our poll and you can rate this a crit, a hit, or a miss. You can always join in the discussion on Facebook and Twitter by searching Crits Happen, or of course, by leaving a comment below in the YouTube channel. But until we see you next time, we hope you enjoy all of your color matching pyramid power building times inside the world of Viceroy. Thanks so much for watching. Keep rolling those dice, and we hope they're all crits.